As a woman formerly employed with Corporate India, I have seen the increasing thrust that organizations give to their diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, DE and I for short. Diversity is the buzzword in corporate corridors today, with organizations going all out to ensure representation of minorities in their workforce, be it in terms of ethnicity, orientation, and now especially after the pandemic from smaller towns and cities. Among all the elements, it is gender diversity that has become somewhat of a hallmark for companies in India. Leaders of the companies in the big league or eyeing the big league give diversity hiring mandates to the human resources departments of their organizations. Yet, all the diversity mandates, all the quotas are not leading to women feeling included in the workplace. My story is about retrieving this missing I from the DE&I equation of companies. It started many years ago, way back in 2007, when I was still Smita Das and not Smita Das Jain, a final year MBA student at a management institute. After a grueling day-long placement process, I was one of the two people to be hired on campus by a big four firm on day zero of placement. Congratulations, Foden. My female friend said, we knew you would make it. My male friend said, we knew if it were possible for any woman to make it, it would be you. Notice the difference here. Four months later, as I started my corporate career in Goa of all places and looked at the sea of 300 odd campus recruits, I met equal number of males and females during the five-day induction. I felt happy about it. A week later, I started the corporate grind and joined my base location. As I took my place in that cramped workstation, having less leg space and even lesser privacy, I saw that in those rows and rows of workstation in the operating level of analysts, senior consultants, and consultants, as a woman at the entry level, I was the norm and not an exception. Again, I felt happy about it. Till one day, many months later, when everyone happened to be in office for some reason, a rarity in consulting. As my eyes went to the other side of the room where there were those hallowed two into two workstations with slightly more slack space, slightly more privacy, where our managers and associate directors, the middle level layer in consulting used to sit. And I noticed that women occupied not more than one of the four chairs in any of the 40 odd clusters of those hallowed workstations. In fact, in some of those clusters, there were no women. I worked in that organization for four and a half years, then moved out. Then again, after four years, boomeranged back to the organization from where my career had begun. This time, there was a swanky new office with hot desk arrangements, more leg space, and no privacy. I met some new and many old faces. One pertinent fact that I noted about the old faces, almost all the male managers and associate directors from my previous tenure had moved on to the senior levels in hierarchy. They had become directors and partners. Whereas, not a single female manager and associate director from my erstwhile tenure was there any more with the firm. Not even one. What had started as a story of equal gender representation at the operating level in 2007 had turned into the narrative of a boys club at the middle and senior level in 2015. That the glass ceiling exists is a well-known fact, with women making up only 20% of the workforce in corporate India. What is a lesser known fact is this flip phenomenon of gender representation. As one moves up the corporate ladder, the representation of women proportionately comes down. If an organization's workforce were to constitute half male and half females, a big if in the first place, 
This will translate to women occupying 38% of managerial roles, 33% of directors, 28% of senior vice presidents, and 21% of C-suite executives. Even in the so-called female-friendly sectors, women are restricted to roles with limited upward mobility, such as bank tellers or customer service relations. Rarely are they given the chance to meet that high-profile client or start a business from scratch. In fact, even in those profiles where women do start out at a meteor line level role, they are either forced to or nudged to take up support roles. I myself have seen many such instances. One of my earliest peers, who till date remains a dear friend, and who started her career on the same day as me, was forced to take up a support role. The reason? Three years after working, she became a mother. And managers were skeptical of her handling strenuous clients and telling longer workers are. They were not staffing her on projects. Instead of fighting the perception battle, she decided to move on. For the record, she is doing very well in that support function. Numbers tell their own stories here, my friends. And this isn't a love story. For every 100 men who are promoted to managerial roles, only 72% are women. 50% of women drop out of the corporate employment pipeline between this junior and middle level of management. 50%. Only 3.7% of CEOs and managing directors of NSE listed companies in India were women in 2019. Slightly higher from 3.2% in 2014. Should we call it progress? Women make up only 5 to 6% of senior level workforce in Indian companies and 15 to 20% in MNCs. This flip is even more pervasive in the boardroom. Due to regulatory interventions, women do constitute 17% of board level positions, but they make up only 11% of board level chairs. So, what makes 50% of these women drop out of the corporate employment pipeline between the junior to middle level? Contrary to perception, it is not family responsibilities, but the prevailing gender disparity that is there in the first step of the corporate ladder. The time when it comes for the junior level to graduate to the middle level. The gender diverse corporate ladder is broken in its bottom rung. As I gave you the statistics, for every 100 men promoted to managerial roles, only 72% are women. McKinsey has been tracking this trend since 2015. Now corporates are left with limited talent pool for women to be promoted to higher levels when the talent pool keeps on get, getting reduced at the first place. The question to ask here is, what causes this broken bottom rung? As I look back at my career, I find the answers in my own story. We all gain knowledge at the later stage of our lives and call it wisdom in hindsight. When I started my career, the men in my team used to go for these smoke breaks. Some to smoke, others to watch them smoke. Being a female non-smoker, I was not a part of the smoke room banters. Then, in most of the evenings, my male counterparts, including the managers and even the directors in some cases, used to catch up over a pint of beer, while I used to hurry home to take care of responsibilities. There have been more than one instances of me turning up at work the next morning to find out that the deliverable or the pitch I had slogged over along with the rest of my teammates, have been reviewed over drinks and dinners the previous night, and the entire storyline changed. I never got a chance to contribute my point of view in these beer reviews. I have been assigned responsibilities such as arranging for the team lunch or organizing a client dinner by selecting a restaurant without being asked what my preference is. Until I became a senior, I have been called for many meetings with the sole purpose of noting down the minutes of the meeting. 
some of the statements that were thrown at me at various stages of my career include, you are a woman, so you would not be able to put up a night out. You are married, so you would not like to travel out station. You are a mother, so we can't staff you in this challenging project. Two, you are here because you are a woman. Unfortunately, I am not the only woman in corporate with such a story. Such stories are the reasons that the diversity programs organizations want go for a toss. The stereotypes that people have, the biases that employers carry, the perception that colleagues, leaders, and co-workers take as reality. These are the microaggressions that women face at workplace from the majority group at work, which is unfortunately still a boys club. The micro and microaggression refers to people-to-people -people interaction. These are the unconscious stereotype biases and prejudices. They are not blatantly overt or discriminatory in nature. The statement from my male friends many years ago that if it were possible for any woman to be picked up by a big four firm, it would be you, was microaggression. The remark from my senior at a stage in my career, you are here because you are a woman, was microaggression. McKenzie and Lenin.org carried a survey in 2018 among 70,000 working women across the globe. The report revealed that 64% of women reported encountering microaggressions in their workplace, making them three times more likely to quit the workforce. 64%. The perpetrators of these microaggressions, the middle and senior level managers, who are still a boys club, pass on women for higher challenges because of their biases and assumptions. The victims of these microaggressions, the women themselves, opt to either change course, as my colleague did some years back, or they simply quit the corporate pipeline. At an individual level, the impact of these microaggressions may vary. But at the cumulative level, the impact is always the same. The compound effect results in eroding and shattering the workplace culture, making the I getting displaced from D, E, and I. Organizations today talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the same breath. While there is a need to uncouple all the three, and put focused efforts into each one of this. It is not about diversity quotas or targets. It is about how you position women in roles that are likely to lead them to higher level elevations that will fix this broken bottom rung. Companies, starting from the women in corporate in senior role themselves, can do a lot to fix this broken bottom ladder. In fact, allyship has a concept where a senior woman in the organization advocates and propagates for the junior women has gained into prominence since 2020. Corporate policies, trainings, communications, leaders leading by examples all have a role to play here. And yet, such top-down approaches can only have a limited impact to counter a problem which is not systemic in nature. People drive the performance in any organization. Each one of us present in this room has the key to counter this culture of microaggression through our microaffirmations. The little acts, deeds by which we affirm someone's identity, make them feel valued and important, validate their experience and expertise. There are five microaffirmations to practice here. Number one, know. Know your friends, teammates, and colleagues. Take out the time to genuinely understand their likes and dislikes. Build healthy working relationship with them and collaborate with each other so that you are part of the team rather than apart from the team. Number two, mirror. Mirror the language that someone uses to affirm their own identity. Pay close attention to how someone pronounces their name, the pronouns that they use, the words that they use to communicate. Then, at the next suitable opportunity, mirror the same language while talking to them. This will make them feel important and show that you care. Number three, acknowledge. 
acknowledge the important religious and cultural festivals that matter to people around you. Acknowledge the key moments and milestones in someone's career. For you, it may be Diwali that is important. For me, it might be Ramadan. While for some of us, it might be World Pride Day or World Autism Day that holds significance. Celebrate these important milestones and festivals with people around you. Number four, encourage. Use your voice to encourage the quieter ones to speak up. In every group, there is always a set of people that is relatively quieter than the rest. And more often than not, one or more women would be part of this group. Encourage the quieter ones to speak up. Number five, amplify. Use your platform to amplify someone else's voices. Like TEDx FIIB has given me this platform today to share my story with you. Similarly, all of us in this room have our own social media handles. Use that platform to give credit to the idea of others, especially one who are quieter. If all of us here were to practice even one of these micro affirmations consistently, we will contribute to a more diverse and inclusive work culture. For an organization is made up of its people and people carry their whole selves to work. We need to be the change that we want to see in the world for the flip to go and the glass ceiling to disappear. Women have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. I hope that at some time in future, when my daughter stands at a stage sharing her story, she will say that she did not encounter any microaggression in corporate or otherwise, that there was no flip and the glass ceiling has disappeared. And that would be the day when the D, E, and I programs in organizations would become redundant. For a diverse and inclusive workplace would have become a norm in a culture where expectations and professionalism are not gender linked. That is what we can achieve. That is what we should try to achieve. Thank you so much.